right, thank you. Um, thanks for everybody for coming. Uh, so I'm Laila, or Laila Abulagod, and I'm uh, in the Department of Anthropology, the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and the Center for the Study of Social Difference. Um, and really, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event, which is the second one in the semester. There's a couple of seats over here, and, and if anybody has a seat, could they raise their hand? There's one over there. Yeah, sorry. Well, this is great. Um, it's the second in the semester um, in uh, our series uh, sponsored by Women Creating Change at CCSD on reframing gender violence, uh, and it's supported by the Dean of the Humanities. Uh, and this panel is called Gender and the Technologies of State Violence. Um, but you should look out. Uh, next semester, we're having two or three events, the first of which is January 26th, uh, I think it is, organized by Paige West uh, about rethinking culture and violence in Papua New Guinea. And she's got some very interesting people uh, coming for that. Um, but before we start, I wanted to thank a lot of people. Uh, I won't name everybody, but thank, uh, thank everybody for uh, being here, but also, um, Catherine Lasota, Liza McIntosh at CSSD for um, Liz Boylan at the uh, law school, the Gender Sexuality Law uh, Center, and Joy Mala Haja, uh, all of who's uh, with a related project on religion and the global framing of gender violence, uh, supported by the Luce Foundation. And all of them have made it possible for us to be here today. There's always so much labor that goes into bringing people and um, making us uh, able to listen and sit in a good place. So thank you all. And thank you for coming. Um, now, Reframing Gender Violence, I know some of you are familiar with our project, but it seeks to engage critically with the terms, the assumptions, uh, and the policies that have underwritten a kind of outpouring of attention and activism over the past couple of decades on violence against women or gender-based violence. And we've been exploring what different parties mean when they talk about this kind of violence, where they see it located, uh, and especially globally. And the goal of the whole series uh, is to kind of move the conversation on this urgent question in new directions, uh, pointing to elisions and exclusions in many common sense understandings of these terms, uh, unpacking the politics of accusation, and deepening the ways in which we engage um, with the manifestations and the causes of such violence, whether migration, war, uh, or on campuses. And uh, we have some incredible speakers today, so I'm really honored that they're here to talk with us. Uh, and they set themselves some questions in relation to the project, which I uh, don't know if everybody saw, so I'll just read them. Uh, and in the order in which they will be speaking, the first was, where is settler colonialism in analyses of gender violence? The second is, should state violence against schoolgirls be called gender-based violence? And third, would <laughs> excuse me, would getting rid of the concept of innocence better enabled us to address gender and uh, racist violence. So I'm just going to introduce our speakers very briefly because I know you're here to hear them uh, and I won't I apologize in advance to them for not listing all their accomplishments, which are many. Uh, but Shireen Razek, is it Razek? Razek? Razek. Um, is a distinguished professor and the Penny Kenner Endowed Chair in Women's Studies at UCLA. And her uh, research and teaching focus on racial violence. And she's written on education, on law, feminism, settler colonialism, and terror. And she's the author, <coughs> most recently, of two um, really important books. Uh, Casting Out, The Eviction of Muslims from Western Law and Politics, which if you haven't read, you should read, and Dying from uh, Improvement, Inquests, and Inquiries into Indigenous Deaths in Custody, which came out in 2015, and she's edited many books as well. Uh, recent, most recently, States of Race, Critical Race Feminism for the 21st Century, and At the Limits of Justice, Women of Color, 
on terror. And she lived in Canada for many years, taught at the University of Toronto, and has recently moved to UCLA. And she says now she realizes how far it is, so she's going to think twice before coming to the East Coast again. <laughs> um, it really is hard to get there from here, or here from there. Uh, I never accept invitations in California. Um, <laughs> and uh, I first uh, met Shireen at the same uh, amazing conference at the Pembroke Center at Brown University that introduced me to our next speaker, uh, now a close colleague and friend and co-director, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, the project with me on religion and glo the global framing of gender violence. Nadra Shalhub kavorkian is a visiting professor here at the law school uh, right now, uh, and she's also the Lawrence D. Beal Chair in Law and Social Work at the Hebrew University, and for many years she directed the Gender Studies Program at Med al Carmel, the Arab Center for Applied Social Research in Haifa. And she's a longtime anti violence, native Palestinian feminist activist and scholar. And her research has focused on femicide, state crime, trauma in militarized and colonized uh, zones, and on securitization. And her recent books are Militarization and Violence Against Women in Conflict Zones in the Middle East and Security, Theology, Surveillance, and the Politics of Fear. And she's currently finishing a book on violence against Palestinian children. Finally, uh, Miriam, but last but not least, uh, our, our own, uh, Miriam Tickton is Associate Professor and Chair of the Anthropology Department. Are you still Chair? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> May God give you strength. Um, at the New School, where, uh, where she previously also directed the Zolberg Center on Global Migration uh, and the Gender Studies Program, so obviously she's good at running things. Um, and I first met her uh, when she came as a postdoc uh, to the Columbia Society of Fellows. Uh, now she's a leading scholar of um, humanitarianism, founding co-editor of the journal Humanity, uh, an international journal of human rights, humanitarianism, and development. And she's the author of Casualties of Care, Immigration, and the Politics of Humanitarianism in France, a book that about regimes of care that my students always single out as transformative of their thinking. Uh, she's working on planetary expansion of humanitarianism and also on the concept of innocence, which you'll talk about today. So I'm really uh, thrilled to have them here at Columbia today. Um, the plan is that they're going to each speak, and it really doesn't do them justice, but 15 to 20 minutes max, uh, so that we can have time for questions and discussion afterwards. So please join me in welcoming them. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Leila, for the invitation. Uh, it's especially terrific to be uh, on this panel with these two uh, old friends and scholars uh, because we're trying to think together through each other's work. And tomorrow, the work that I'm actually um, going to be discussing is the work that I'm trying to experiment with whether or not I could use the concept of disposability. Um, so. For those of you that thought you were coming to hear that today, you're not, that's tomorrow. <laughs> and <laughs> what this is today is, is kind of trying to just lay out the broad lines of an analysis that has as its heart settler colonialism. So how do you put, uh, how do you analyze the violence uh, that comes at indigenous women uh, remembering settler colonialism, which is so often forgotten. So let me start with, uh, a fairly recent killing. Uh, apologies to people who have close connections to these kinds of deaths because they, there's always something quite awful about discussing them. A police officer shot L'Oreal Sinigini, a Navajo woman, five times within 20 seconds after he stopped her on a sidewalk supposedly to apprehend her for shoplifting. She was 26 years old, a young Navajo woman. Can we consider this police shooting colonial slash racial violence and gendered colonial racial violence? That's the question that I want to explore today. And I do so, this is a case in, in, uh, in uh, Arizona, and I, I, do, I come to this as a scholar who's mainly worked on Canada and on settler colonialism in Canada. So 
two years ago, as, as Leila mentioned, I published a book on indigenous deaths in custody. And since then, I've been kind of examining the connections between indigenous death, black death, and migrant death, and uh, working with uh, people who have, who have the same project in different settler societies. So, uh, and one thing that I'll say right away is that the uh, killing that happens in under 20 seconds is common to all of them. <laughs> so then the question is, you know, what's going on here? Um, so from this particular research vantage point, I feel that I can argue, I can show, and I will not be able in 15, 20 minutes to talk about all the data. So I'm just trying to say what the sense is, and you can ask me about the data uh, later on. But from this um, vantage point, the encounter between L'Oreal Sinigini and Officer Austin Shipley, who shot her, appears unmistakably a colonial encounter. And to grasp what unfolded in that encounter, you have to absolutely jettison such concepts like bias or stereotype or discrimination, which the court usually loves. Um, and you can't restrict yourself to the matter of police capacity to deal with mentally ill people. Um, you can't also say that this killing was the action of one rogue cop. Those explanations, uh, it, it is my intention to sort of, you know, wipe those off the table through an analysis of settler colonialism. So it's not at all a matter of one bad apple. I, I think it really matters that we name this gendered colonial or racial violence. And I want to explore what you have to do if you're going to name it that way. And uh, the reason for accepting this invitation was really to uh, rehearse once again what you know you're doing in your writing because sometimes when it's so hard to say you realize there's so many things you've kind of left out and that's you know my secret agenda is I, wa I want to know how to to fill it in so let me just describe how this case felt to me after looking at the video tape because the killer was wearing a cop cam after looking at all the interviews and so on a call goes out that a young Indian woman has shoplifted and perhaps more important, has harassed the assistant manager of a convenience store. She seems to be recorded on these documents as displaying some kind of open defiance. Uh, a white man in a police car soon pulls up alongside her on the sidewalk and proceeds to apprehend her. His cop cam shows that she initially tries to resist, she brushes him away and she tries to walk away. Uh, he wrestles her to the ground, and she can be seen holding a very small instrument in her hand. It fit into the palm of his hand. He called the, they, the police department calls it scissors. It actually was more like tweezers that she's holding in her hands. This then enables the police narrative that she was holding an edged weapon that posed imminent danger to his life. Uh, he draws his gun and under 22 seconds fires five bullets retreating from her as she lay dying, he vomits, and then his partner who arrives shortly on the scene, the two of them back away from the scene and watch her twitch and die over the next several minutes. Her body is left on the sidewalk for several hours uh, as the medical and forensic teams do their, their job. Uh, it, importantly, but I won't get to that in this talk, they charge her after her death with assaulting a police officer. So Nadra and I have been talking a lot, following Nadra's lead actually, about the way in which colonial, settler colonial states are really invested in the dead bodies of the colonized. So the dead bodies provide some kind of raw material for power that, uh, so it doesn't end with death. It, it carries on with death in terms of what such states do with those bodies. And so, uh, what's colonial or racial about this event? I want to offer an answer that begins with the historical processes that brought L'Oreal Sinigini and Austin Shipley to that encounter, processes that began with indigenous dispossession and that continue with colonial policing. The shooting took place in Winslow, Arizona, which is, and I think Americans have a very interesting term for those kinds of towns. They're called border towns, not because they border the border, 
but because they sit next to reservations. So I think that's super interesting all by itself. For those of you that like this kind of discursive <laughs> work, uh, this is very important. But uh, there are very uh, terrific scholars doing research on the violence of border towns. And so uh, I think it is necessary to begin with the racial and spatial economies of the settler town, economies that are really organized around the relentless and brutal policing and eviction of indigenous peoples from <coughs> spaces that are understood as belonging to the settler. And from this broad picture, I want to turn inwards to consider what the body of an indigenous woman means under settler colonialism and what Austin Shipley likely saw and felt when he grabbed L'Oreal Singhani that night. I think we have to consider what went before the shooting and what came after. And I want to focus on the violence that is imprinted on her body and to, to propose that this violence makes the white man a fully colonial man and the settler state a successful colonial state that has successfully dispossessed. Finally, I want to turn, I don't think I will actually have time to turn to the police narrative of this encounter uh, and ultimately the legal narrative that will transform this colonial moment into a narrative about a 250 pound cop wearing body armor, possessing a loaded gun who said he felt a fear and a threat to the extent that he had to shoot a 100-pound woman wielding a pair of tweezers. The transformation of L'Oreal Sinigadi into a dangerous and uncontrollable and perhaps bestial force is completed in the police narrative when her pills falling on the sidewalk from her purse provide an opportunity to add the label mentally ill. So I want to end sort of my reflection by asking, by, by saying that we must consider the psychic underpinnings of settler colonialism. That is to say, we must consider how violence is required for the making of a colonial self when analyzing and responding to this killing. Um, so it needs to be stressed right at the, the outset that settler colonialism is ongoing. Um, and this is not only in the sense that the theft of land and resources continue apace, which it certainly does, Standing Rock being just only the most recent dramatic example, but also in the sense that the settler always faces a crisis of legitimacy, and not least because indigenous people continue to survive and resist. So the settler engages in daily practices of emplacement, that is of making himself, and I'm going to use the masculine all the time because I only have time to attend to the making of colonial masculinity, but there is a very big story in colonial femininity. So the settler uh, engages in making himself legitimate. How do you become the original inhabitants of this land if you are not indigenous to it? For the settler to establish himself as legitimate and to become the original citizen, he must continually establish that indigenous people are dead or dying and are forever incapable of being stewards of the land by virtue of being a damaged people unable to survive modern life. So let's begin with where the event occurred. Under colonial arrangements, the colonial city belongs to the settler. An indigenous presence in the city inevitably contests settler occupation. The cities and towns that lie next to reserves or reservations, as they're called in the United States, are militarized zones for indigenous people. They are places where the police devote themselves to surveilling and disciplining. I would go so far as to say that the indigenous body itself is a militarized zone, a target of settler violence and police violence. When I say settler, I'm including settlers and the police. The Indian wars have never really ended in the minds of the settlers, and this is for the simple reason that the same economic system remains in place. When Canadian soldiers on peacekeeping duty in Somalia and American soldiers in Vietnam both describe where they are as in Indian country, you catch a glimpse of the power of these historical tracks of racially inflected memory. So it is very helpful, and this is why I'm very glad to have Nadira on the panel, it is very helpful to think of these racial spatial economies as occupation. 
Under occupation, policing is about controlling the movements of the occupied. It is fundamentally about evicting indigenous people from what is considered to be civilized life. White settler colonies such as Canada, Australia, and the United States all have very similar histories of over-policing and evicting indigenous people from cities. For example, in Canada, you may have heard of the 150-year-old practice. Probably you didn't hear, because nobody in the US hears about anything outside the US. Sorry. <laughs> but these histories of uh, dumping indigenous people outside of the city uh, uh, in sub-zero temperatures, and then they have to walk back without coats or shoes, and they freeze to death. This is so much a practice that it has a name, Starlight Tours. <coughs> so I have written of these freezing deaths and the way in which, uh, in law, they're either denied outright or transformed into the practice of a few uh, ineffective or, or uh, you know, unprofessional cops. Indigenous men are always uh, in the city, but not of it. They're, they move through city space as shadow figures, banished within. This is in spite of population. So on the Canadian prairies, for example, indigenous people are almost 50% of the city's population. That's a big amount. Um, and in these places like Winslow, it, it is also quite a big amount. Um, so many research reports have confirmed, regardless of gender, indigenous people on city streets are widely assumed by both the public and the police to be out of place. In this sense, you can see similar similarities to black populations. Uh, settler sovereignty, to, to make the obvious point, is maintained through policing. And uh, there is something that, that we should consider at this point, because I have noticed that this is kind of invisible in the United States. Um, Native people are far more likely to be killed by police than any other group, including blacks. The shootings and deaths in custody that result from medical neglect or outright violence very closely resemble the, shoot, the, the deaths that I explore in my book for Canada. As a practice that is so intimately connected to sovereignty, colonial policing simultaneously requires and gives birth to the kind of police officer I suspect Officer Shipley to be. To emphasize once again, it would be a mistake to think of him as a lone rogue cop there is a system of policing in place and a justice system that has as its core goals the disciplining and management of Indians. Black scholars have repeatedly pointed out that policing and the prison system, for instance, are the second installments of slavery. So too we ought to consider the context of policing in which L'Oreal Singhani was killed as the second installment of dispossession. The white masculinities, and white always means those aspiring to be white as well, there are plenty of those, uh, even Navajo cops in this sense, uh, are very key to the settler project. They are required to uphold it and their own subjectivities are made through violence. Let me invite you briefly to think about how do male colonizers come to know themselves through violent encounters with indigenous women? Encounters that we all know about, but seldom speak about. Typically, these encounters entail sexual violence. I will talk briefly about my own journey here to think about how I came to understand this as colonial violence. I first wrote about this form of violence many years ago when I analyzed the trial of Stephen Comerfield and Alex Ternowetsky, who were two white college basketball players who murdered Pamela George, a Soto Cree woman after contracting with her for sexual services. Before uh, her death, Helen Betty Osborne, an indigenous schoolgirl, was gang raped and murdered by white men in De Pa, Manitoba, a murder that the entire town knew about and kept silent about for 20 years. When I first started thinking about this, I did not recognize these acts of sexual violence directed at indigenous women as a widespread phenomenon even though I would sometimes stand at the podium and talk about my analysis as I'm doing here, and indigenous men and women would come up to me after and say things like, three of my sisters died this way. 
As you know, or you may not know again, that Canada has now launched a national inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women. There are so many of them. Uh, the, the count officially is 1,200, but everybody knows it's absolutely well above that. In spite of this public inquiry, in most quarters, the knowledge that there is a widespread phenomenon of white men sexually brutalizing and murdering indigenous women is almost never said aloud. Instead, the pauses and silences of the public debate have been filled with mention of another kind of violence, the violence that indigenous men do to indigenous women. It is hard to say aloud what white men do to indigenous women, and we all have our reasons for not saying it out aloud. I can tell you more about mine later on. There is only one instance that I have ever found in law, in Canadian law, when the sexual violence that indigenous women so routinely encounter is actually named as a violence directed at them because they are indigenous. This occurred in connection with the murder of Helen Betty Osborne and has not been said since. The commissioners of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry of Manitoba concluded, and I'm going to quote them because it is the singular legal moment, it is clear that Betty Osborne would not have been killed if she had not been Aboriginal. The four men who took her to her death from the streets of Dapa, Manitoba that night had gone looking for an Aboriginal girl with whom to party in quotation marks. They found Betty Osborne. When she refused, she was driven out of town and murdered. Those who abducted her showed a total lack of regard for her person. Those who stood by while the physical assault took place and those who knew of the story and remained silent must share the guilt. It is important to read this unique statement out loud, not as a pronouncement that such terrible things don't happen to non-Indigenous women, Instead, I want to retrieve its substance. To Helen Betty Osborne's killers, it is her indigeneity that mattered most. It is that part of her, which is to say all of her, since she can't divide herself, that they wanted to annihilate in as brutal and intimate a way as possible. How might we understand this very specific gendered form of violence as colonial violence? Well, to do so, I, I you know, have a sort of methodology around it that it seems to me commonsensical, but you, know, you can decide what might be the pitfalls. I first asked what brought Pamela George and her killers to the encounter that night, and it's, it's fairly easy to trace with Pamela George. Uh, extreme poverty, the desire to feed her children, pushed her, pushed her into prostitution. The poverty began when her own community, the Soto, were dispossessed, but it continued as their lands were flooded to build a dam to bring irrigation to white farmers. It is equally important, though, to consider what brought the two men to the stroll that night. Pamela George's killers knew themselves as entitled to her body. They were white middle-class college students who had just finished exams, coming from the white suburb. They were the beneficiaries of all that impoverished Pamela George's community. Nevertheless, these two men found it absolutely necessary to leave the spaces of their white middle-class homes and classrooms and to go downtown to seek out what they and their friends called at the trial, seeking out an Indian hooker. I think it was also very important to note that sometimes they would do these things, not these two men alone, but all of their friends, hiding the girls under blankets, their own girlfriends, so that they could witness this moment. Um, but more often than not, it was a moment of homosocial bonding. And so the question I think we need to ask is what does this violence do? I suggest that the violence establishes, perhaps as nothing else can, that they are men with an unquestioned right to go anywhere and do anything. This making of the white masculine self. Oh my God, okay, fast. I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't Give know. me a minute to wrap up. So it is gendered racial violence that destroys indigenous communities even as it regenerates the white social body. And so I have, uh, in, in subsequent to this writing about Pamela George and Helen Betty Osborne, I have started to name what this is as terror. 
uh, and this is in order to capture the everyday systematized targeting. But it is also to capture that there's a specific content to this violence, which I won't talk about in uh, you know, repeating it, but it is excessive. It is not just a murder, and it is not just one bullet. It is a lot of things done to one body. And so I think uh, when I go to, to L'Oreal Singhani, she didn't die out of the, you know, the, the same context of sexual violence, but we can, we can see in it the same excessiveness, the 22 seconds where she's very easily killed. And uh, we can also see in it the systematized response, the protection that the killer receives and the refusal of the Department of Justice to investigate the police. And so I think um, for me, the 22 seconds are something to consider very seriously because it is annihilation that the person has in mind. But what I find really important to consider in this kind of case are all the things that are so hard to say to actually talk about the relationship between white men and indigenous women. And so although I have learned of these things from Navajo communities and others, no one will say out loud that there is a regular practice to take Navajo women outside the town, brutalize them, rape them, and bring them back in. L'Oreal Sinigani shows in the video that she was very afraid of Austin Shipley. And after I gave this talk, a few weeks ago, people came up and said, oh yeah, we know he was one of those. So people know that. People know about his white supremacist uh, background and, and the, the, the things he carried around to show that he was white supremacist and, and the things that other people in the police force carry around. All of these things reveal to me an extraordinarily violent and self-making encounter takes place. And if we start our conversation somewhere else other than the colonial, we will never get to what this violence is. So we have to uh, think twice before we use other kinds of explanations. Um, th you know, I could go on and on about the kinds of explanations that have to do with prostitution, which some feminists, most feminists call sex work, um, and obscure the line of colonial violence that is in it. Uh, but that's, that's for tomorrow. Um, I, I want to end by saying, you know, when I thought of Miriam's work, um, you know, we always need innocent victims to be able to talk about them in any way. But I, I think that what we uh, really need is innocent settlers. And that's what we do in all of these cases. Thanks. Thank you, Leila, and thank you all for, for coming. and yeah. really honored to be on this panel. Uh, my talk will take you to a different space, but you can see the similarity, especially when Shireen was talking about freezing uh, death, and I talk about freezing in death in Palestine, but I will stick to my talk and, uh, and talk about the site that I'm looking. Sana, a seven-year-old schoolgirl, said, I was so excited, happy to go back to school, to get my books, and look what happened. I came to school only three days ago, and now there is no school. They demolished it. Sana is from Jubal Tabe, east of Bethlehem. She was talking to me on the ruins of her school, filled with sadness and despair, mourning the loss, looking exhausted while sitting under the sun. In the Palestinian occupied territories, Three educational facilities for Palestinian children, especially, and I'm talking about this year, have been demolished. In, in March 2017 in Aysawiyi, I was sitting, uh, and while accompanying children to school, I noticed that three girls were running on the path to school, telling each other, hurry, hurry, they are pulling their rifles. They want to shoot. They will uh, gas us, hurry. Jenna, a 10-year-old schoolgirl tripped. I helped her, talking to her to the side, taking to her to the side and calming her down. Her two classmates joined us and shared their daily ordeals. Jana said, why are they around our schools? Why are they after little girls? What did I do? All I did is walk back from school. Now the question is, how do girls like Sana and like Jana read these acts of daily violence against them and their education within a greater and larger context of continuous racial dispossession. The way that girls narrate their route to school is my site of analysis. Following their voices, I argue 
that state terror against school children is intentional. And we must understand the political work of daily violence as happens to the schoolgirls as gender-based violence. The use of daily violence against schoolgirls' bodies and lives turn them into children but no bodies, unwanted others, and continues to assert itself profoundly through intervention and the disruption of the very intimate into a disruption of those tender ties in the family among kids, among our relationships. And it is visceral, yeah? In my work since 1996, as well as in my writing in my upcoming book, I'm trying to understand why targeting children? If in other settler colonial context it was killing the Indian in the child and saving the child, is it really saving the Palestinian child in any way? Or if it's stolen generation and stolen childhood in Australia, what is really happening in Palestine? So my understanding is really what are the political gains? And how is it that it's um, uh, practiced? And what can violence against schoolgirls tell us? So I really want to invite you to think with me about what goes on. To answer such questions, I situate the experience of girls from occupied Palestinian territories, mainly in occupied East Jerusalem, where I live, at the center. The experience of Jana and Sana reveal the gendered nature or constraints of occupation and the enactment of state violence on schoolgirls' bodies and spaces and lives en route to school. These are not one or two incidents of violence, as you can see. On October 18, 2017, the Union of Parents in Aysawiyi needed to stop sending kids to school, fearing the interference of the soldiers, the kidnapping of kids, the arrest of children, and the shooting of girls and boys en route to school. So it's not an, a, an, a one incident. On Monday, November 7, this year, Zahwit al-Quds, a kindergarten and a primary school in Beit Hanina, was raided by the Israeli forces. Firyal, a 15-year-old schoolgirl, wrote me, I worry about my future. Here in Silwan, walking to school is a risk. Settlers are always after us, pushing us, scaring us, and throwing stones at us. The soldiers check our bags and keep us on the side for a long time. After my experience this year and all the troubles and worries of my parents, I think I will leave my school. School is not safe, the roads are not safe, and my family might move out of Silwan. Now, Friel's ordeal speaks to how she registered this state harm over her route to school and her life. The daily landscape of her life becomes a territory of political maneuvering of the settler colony captured in a spatial temporal path because it's 7.15 in the morning while she's on her way to school. Her captivity in the context of unending violence and uncertain future reproduces racialized logic with no imagined future. Friel's voice in the context of settler colonialism provides insight into the importance of understanding violence against her in a spiral transgressional manner because it's so many violences that are occurring. It urges us to remember that military occupiers dominate space, they dominate time in ways that constrain schools, girls' life and experiences and stifle their capacity to take up space on their own terms as they grow as children and as schoolgirls. In a, in a letter called A Rain of Rifles Penetrating Our Bodies, schoolgirls like Jana and Friel pointed to the need to explore and expose the violent, sexualized use of Israeli guns in their educational space. They discussed the routinization and normalization of the presence of gun that are violating their safety. And you can see with, this, with the pictures that are uh, here, the violence inherent in holding, pointing, cruising around occupied East Jerusalem with rifles and other military weapons constructed spatial relations of domination <coughs> that invaded schoolgirls' safety and that are there to say who is in control and who is dominated. 
the visibility and performativity of the killing machine, those rifles, of the romanticized potential shooter in the settler colony displays both uncertainty and insecurity. Firearms are machines that shoot and that kill. They attain symbolic meaning in their interaction with people, in their construction of masculinity, of, and I quote, men seeking to arm their desire, as King would say. Indeed, the penis is championed as a love pistol, meat pistol, sex pistol, pocket pistol, or even a piece, or moreover, the phallus and the firearm becomes interchangeable, as Springwood would say. Guns animate and symbolize dominance, resistance, and frontiers. They manifest power and fear, insecurity and violence and presence. The Israeli occupation's use of great guns, of really big guns, as instruments of power and domination reflects a masculinized apparatus of dispossession and penetration, I argue, a manifestation of the power to use violence always at any moment directed at the individual, including the girl child. As I have suggested in my work on the violence of aesthetics and the enactment of state criminality, by reorganizing the space, colonizers claim Jerusalem for themselves. And this is part of the Judaization of Jerusalem and the eviction of the Palestinian. The eviction of the native is justified by colonial laws, performances, parades, and other modes of occupation, including what I call the occupation of the senses and the use of guns to maim, as the spiritual would call it, to kill and to further incarcerate following death. Now, guns and rifles and their ability to invade the intimate draw from a racialized identification system in which Israel manages the Palestinian families through such process of, for example, family reunification and the residency status or lack of, yeah? and through colonial laws and regulations. Schoolgirls explained how much they fear being stopped on their way to school and asked for the kushan. And the kushan is a kind of birth certificate. So they are always worried that the police and the soldier would stop them. East Jerusalem's legal, uh, spatial, and socioeconomic colonial policies reinforce the advantage of the Israeli Jewish population, enhancing not only the vulnerability, but further the penetratability of the Palestinian intimate space, intimate homes, schools, and bodies of schoolgirls on their way to school. The path to school is another space of penetration. The lack of investment in educational infrastructure while favoring Jews, while the militarization of education and the public space facilitate <coughs> an unending infiltration of the police and the military. The constant presence of security personnel submits school children, teachers, parents to body search and other violations and humiliation. Security forces attack, arrest, stop, search uh, young girls while depriving them of their right to safety en route to school. A letter from Nawal uh, provided a painful testimony, and I quote, here in Jerusalem, we girls are persecuted. From the moment I leave home, the settlers start my morning with their harassment. Today, one of them blocked my way out of our home, and I stood there waiting for him to move to the side so I could pass. I called my mother, and we were both pushed inside the house by three of them. Finally, I walked to school, looking around me, checking if they are pulling at my veil like they did yesterday, or using a string to make me fall. Their loud voices that speak Hebrew. Their language, their rifles, their daily screams at us made me always very anxious. I have childhood diabetes from all those scares. Now hearing Noelle's story, en route to school, the violent technologies of scaring her with the rifles, the guns, pointed at her body walking to school, the loud voices screaming at her in a language that she does not understand, the theatricality of her search that took place in the public space, the public humiliation, reveals the multiplicity of violent acts against her. Strip search, Artexaga argues, constitute a gendered form of political domination driven by imagined scenario of state sexual violence. While Nawal did not undergo a strip search as defined legally or as defined by Artexaga, 
The body surge and the unfailing at 7.15 a.m. is not a sexually neutral act. The political, sexual, gendered performance taking place along the educational path in a space used by children on their way to school reveals violence against the girl child. The gendered practices of Israel's security necessity comprise a highly sexualized state act that violate their rights. Schoolgirls reveal the terrorizing effect of the use of pistols, guns, and dogs by police and soldiers. A 14-year-old wrote me, we schoolgirls are at risk of being shot every day, being bit and attacked by the police and military dogs. All of us, all those walking in the streets were horrified. Just look around you. You know all those weapons can be emptied in your bodies. Fast. Last Tuesdays, I felt fear that I never felt. The dog's mouth was so big, I saw them, the soldiers, planning an attack on us schoolgirls. And we started crying and begging them not to harm us. I stopped talking, and my legs could not walk. Now, the gratification of the police and the soldiers Seeing schoolgirls terrified, confused, tripping, and falling in a scene that schoolgirls describe repeatedly. Indeed, the younger schoolgirls spoke to me with more details about what is going on, the, the voyeurism of them, the body search, and the psychological pain. They discussed the use of dogs, the separation devices that are narrowed all the time so they can touch their bodies, and it's all to maintain security. The creation of small corridors for girls to walk to school and the zoning of some areas for Jews only both serve to highlight daily who is respected in that space and who is endangering the peacefulness of the city. Occupy the East Jerusalem's geographies exhibit the mundane violence, expulsion, and penetration. The colonial administration of the space regulated by law, law enforcement personnel, heavily armed, carrying their big rifles, pointy, penetrating rifles, is sexualized to the point of virtual rape scene. One of the girls noted in a group discussion, the walk, the, I quote, the walk to school is tricky. I wish I could fly to school rather than walking between them, between the soldiers. They harass us, they gaze at us, and we all hear the girls can tell you stories of feeling the rifle on our behind, heads, faces, even between our legs. Only yesterday, Hanan tripped because one of them pushed his rifle between her legs. On hearing this, a peer reacted in loud and irritated voice, just watch how they carry their rifle. Just watch how they stand facing us. I sincerely feel someone is penetrating my visceral. The brutality of the mode of holding weapons, standing and pointing, as the girls noted, is deeply sexualized and racialized. Indeed, sexual violence compromise an integral part of the colonial and settler colonial technologies of domination and control. Such sexualized oppressive practices towards schoolgirls situate Israeli men and women in positions of authority and expose schoolgirls to sexual violence that a male family member walking alongside them cannot imagine. In a letter entitled, These Streets Are Packed With Pain, Arwa wrote, I reach home devastated. After those soldiers and the police holding their guns and rifles hurt me, really caused me pain, physical and psychological. I didn't know how to explain it to my family. See, my father walks in the same path, and he feels the same. But he is not a young girl. He is not a woman. No one pushes a rifle between his legs. They can shoot him without hesitation, so when he passes, he does it fast and tries to not think about his humiliation. Do you think he would think about what his little girls feel? It's too bad. He can barely raise his head when walking. He can't see my pain. Too hard. I prefer to leave him with his pain and keep in mind that he works in one of their shops. Yes, an Israeli shop. He cleans it to feed us. Her exactly here exactly we notice the state's terrorism as it attacks those tender ties in the family. 
Arwa's letter expressed sympathy towards her parents, daily ordeal. It reveals a deep understanding of how her fellow schoolgirls navigate their way to school or home in pain and suffering. Elsewhere in the letter, Arwa wrote, the rain of rifles penetrating our bodies. So state sexual violence created and really creates caged spaces for schoolgirls where male soldiers can point their rifles and female soldiers can conduct the body strip search. It is these moments when the settlers act, walks, looks, and grip on their rifles that sexual abuse occurs. The inscription of invasive acts on route to school is a political text that cannot be silenced. Yeah? It's telling us a story. It's a story of power, but more than that, it's a story of sexual abuse. Let me finish with the last section of my talk, which is Fatmi Hajiz. Fatmi Hajiz was 15 years old, schoolgirl, who was arrested for time, imprisoned for almost a month in an Israeli detention center, and tortured. During the hunger strike of Palestinian detainees this year, she decided to join them in hunger strike. She was shot and killed on the stairs of the Mahir Isfatmi, Damascus uh, gate on May 7th, on the same path that schoolgirls walk to school every day. As you can see in the photo, she remained bleeding on the ground while soldiers surrounded her little body. I interrogate the extrajudicial killing. And maybe sh I shouldn't call it extrajudicial because it's judicial, it's legal of schoolgirls like Fatmi in order to consider the violence against the bleeding girls' dead bodies as gendered, sexualized violence. The violation that resulted in ending the life of young schoolgirls like Fatmi allowed settlers standing around to engage with extreme form of sexualized racial violence, looking at her unbreathing body in a mode of speciesism. As Joseph Pogliese explained, racism is imbricated with speciesism, which positions the target, in our case the child, outside the legal and ethical frame of right-bearing person. Such analysis is predicated on what Foucault termed the biological Caesar, the death of the bad race, something that will make life in general healthier and purer, as Foucault said. As I started, in the settler colony, dispossession goes beyond dispossession of land. It is the attack on tender spaces and children's bodies and lives. Fatmi's extrajudicial killing was called Palestinian terrorism. Her murder, as the murder of other girls, is a form of neutralization of the terrorist other, as the settlers defined it. Killing them becomes revenge of the settler. It becomes an acceptable, justifiable, and even needed act of violence. Fatmi's shot body interrupted the order of the settler state. Interruption, as Audra Simpson reminds us, continues to take place in different modes in the settler colony. But the body of Nuf was also shot and killed less than a month after Fatmi. However, Nuf did not die immediately, and her body failed to do what it was supposed to do for the settler, which means to die fast. And the settlers insisted on claiming accessibility, penetratability, and rapability of her bleeding and about to die body by calling her name, by calling her bitch, by calling her really, and by, by hoping that she will be fucked. So Fatmi and Nuf, females, girls, womanly body, are, were there to tell us a real story. Their dead bodies loaded with meaning disordered the political order that we see in Jerusalem of the unending theft of land and the unending theft of life. They are most dangerous as they are reproducers of life and of other political order and other political life. Their dead bodies were kept incarcerated in the Israeli refrigerators after their death. Their frozen bodies continued to speak of identity land continuity, to speak, to tell a story. Their bodies possess living histories of state criminality that has dispossessed territory, violated, penetrated, harmed, and continues to cause suffering when and while evicting even the mere childhood from the dead bodies. Fatmi's and Nuf bodies were rendered non-children, carrying no value, no girlhood, because they are Palestinian and 
representing land reproduction and a just cause. Their fleshy bleeding bodies are disciplined in a spectacular mode as species to reorder the disorder caused by their alleged stabbing. They are there, shot, wounded, killed, bleeding, to reassure the settlers imagination that they have to be shot, penetrated, violated, fucked, and to die. So if Patrick Wolf is talking about settler colonialism has a structure and the ongoing structure of its dispossession is embedded in that logic of elimination, I would like to argue that this structure moves through the bodies and lives of schoolgirls in my case, as through the time and place of the native communities amounting, and we should really call it state terrorism. I'll stop here. I just want to start by saying thank you so much to Lila for inviting me and thank you it's just a great honor to be up here with these incredible women who've been my role models and mentors and friends and really have I think shaped the way for me in, in unmeasurable uh, ways so I started my project uh, in order to trace the deployment of innocence as a political concept arguing that it has moved to the center of political life today I was thinking, for instance, of the now famous image of Elan uh, Kurdi, the three-year-old Syrian boy whose body washed up onto a Turkish beach in September 2015, and how he grabbed the world's attention, eliciting sympathy rather than the usual mix of fear and indifference towards those who have left their homes to land on European shores. I suggested that the photo gave the refugee crisis a new face, innocence. There is perhaps no more essential image of innocence than that of a child. Humanitarian organizations regularly figure children on their home pages and in fundraising materials to elicit support for those considered most vulnerable. But, as I wrote, some images of children are considered more heartrending than others. Why did Elon catch the world's attention? Since then, many children's bodies have washed up onto the shores of Europe with little response. The point, of course, is that only some people in some plights get noticed when innocence is what our, draws our attention to them. Furthermore, while innocence can compel responses to important events, such as the, again, so-called refugee crisis or the war in Syria, it can also create a distinction between worthy and unworthy victims in these same events. While many say the photo of Eileen Kurdi is what finally shamed Europe into action, I pointed to the fact that ideas and images of innocence and the moral imperative they engender have a long history of actually hurting the people they intend to help. So I, with the project, I wanted to understand the concept of innocence, its historical and philosophical groundings, and how it functions as a political, not simply a moral concept. What exactly is innocence? Why are we morally compelled by it? What gives it its power? My goal was to see how such moral and ethical terms come to structure what we think of as politics, and what we can do, think, and feel how they map political possibilities as well as impossibilities. Then Trump got elected. <laughs> <laughs> and around the world, right-wing populisms reared their head. In the writing about innocence, I'd been largely thinking about a secular liberal world. After the election, I had to rethink, how does the concept of innocence play in an illiberal world? Is it still relevant? And let me be clear, it's not that I suddenly now hesitate to critique liberalism or liberal values. I actually find that this is precisely the time to make space for more radical political agendas. Rather, I've been wondering if innocence still plays a central role politically, and if so, how? So that's what I want to try to talk a little bit about today. So it soon became apparent that even in this illiberal era, images of children are powerful. In April 2017, when Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad attacked his own people with chemical weapons, US President Donald Trump said in response, and I'm quoting, it crossed a lot of lines for me. When you kill innocent children, innocent babies, babies, little babies, with a chemical gas that's so lethal, people were shocked to hear what gas it was. Of course, we are stuck with the question, of which children are allowed to be figured as innocent. Why these Syrian children, not Mexican children, of course not Palestinian children. Let me back up a bit. Innocence refers to a state of guilelessness, artlessness, want of knowledge or sense. It's defined as freedom from specific guilt, freedom from cunning and artifice, freedom from sin, guilt, or moral wrong in general. This is a negative freedom that ends up being so free, it's seemingly free of content. 
It's a state of moral and epistemic purity. And yet, if we follow it through, the concept of innocence does not describe a clear-cut state of any sort of purity. Rather, it helps to distinguish morally acceptable forms of knowledge, action, and experience. One could say is that it acts as a method to distinguish and demarcate human kinds by way of purity or impurity. That is, innocence is not defined simply by a period of life called childhood, as we already just saw, or by outside standards such as age, but by class, gender, and racial background, among other histories, uh, experiences, and positionalities. Certain conditions enable the space for an unsullied childhood. Clearly, class formation is important here in configuring a space and time understood as pure, as empty, and free of knowledge. But obviously, so is race. As feminist theorist Bell Hooks has noted, black children in the United States, particularly black boys, are never allowed to be children. This is also true for black girls, who, starting as early as five years old, are treated as more adult than, than their white counterparts, with presumed knowledge of topics like sex. Racial regimes mean that they're never allowed this period of untroubled and ignorant life. They're immediately interpolated into the structures and hierarchies of society, which render their knowledge suspect. Historian Robin Bernstein argues, in fact, that childhood innocence was from the very beginning racialized as white in the United States. It came into being in the second half of the 19th century in relation to its other, the black child, who was constructed as a piccaninny, a non-feeling, non-innocent juvenile worker. These racial understandings have carried over today. A black child cannot innocently pick up a toy gun, as we know from Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old boy shot and killed by the police in Cleveland. There's no space for such innocence, such unknowing. Innocence thus produces and regulates ontologies of human kinds. When one is a non-innocent child, one is no longer a child. One is simply expelled from the category. So innocence works to produce human kinds by regulating distinctions between deserving and undeserving. And it does this by way of, uh, of impurity and purity, which are in turn racialized and gendered. So in many ways, innocence determines and marks humanity's limits. Those who are the most innocent are at its borders, in the sense that they're not understood as corrupt as is a normative humanity. Nor uh, are they fully human, though, in the Enlightenment sense of having reason, will, or autonomy. So innocence acts as the boundary for these ideas of personhood, where this constituent outside is simultaneously idealized and denigrated. So it produces a space where hierarchies of humanity can be elaborated. So I just want to say here that um, I'm particularly concerned with the ethical moral versions of the concept of innocence, not so much with the legal concepts. Um, and you know, there's obviously a lot to say. I'm just focusing on the ethical more for now. And, and one of the reasons is because in contemporary legal terms, innocence is actually about acquittal, of course, and about reasonable doubt uh, about a defendant's guilt. You don't have to prove the, prove the purity of innocence, right? You don't have to have any certainty. Um, but in the ethical, moral case, there is much less flexibility. It's much less compromising. And I think um, even though these registers work together to produce um, the meaning of innocence in our everyday lives, I think the ethical moral register has been deployed in more, uh, deployed in more salient and perhaps violent ways. So I'm, that's where I'm focusing right now. So I believe the ethical moral understandings of innocence continue to be deployed in the illiberal era, but they take on new twists. So in the time that I have here, I just want to think um, about something that is becoming more important in this right-wing populist area, and that's the way that innocence helps to prop up power, exactly as Shireen was saying in kind of the settler colonial. Indeed, how, um, how power, those in power, capture innocence and use it to purify or absolve themselves. So there are two variations on this, the way it works, I think, in liberal regimes and the way it's now increasingly working in illiberal regimes. And so in the illiberal sense, it's my first time working it through, so I ask you to bear with me. Um, so with the liberal, I think it's more familiar to everyone, the liberal humanitarian version. Uh, while the concept of innocence shifts according to the constellation of experiences and histories in which it's located, it nevertheless always carries with it the desire to protect and the impetus to take responsibility for those whom, in their want of knowledge, cannot take care of themselves, the innocents. Guilelessness evokes the need for care. Innocence cannot take uh, innocent people, innocents, uh, cannot take responsibility for themselves. But this means that it props up a feeling of control in those who care for the innocent. 
It assures them not only of their power, but also of their knowledge insofar as the innocent person is oblivious. It creates a class of saviors. Gayatri Spivak called out one instance of this type of action provoked by the idea of innocence and fed by the comfort of superiority in knowledge and power. She called it white men saving brown women from brown men. This is a script that continues to have enormous appeal, as we have seen in the past with the US interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan in the name of saving the women, and in huge political followings and money garnered by people like Somali Mom and her foundation, which works to rescue girls from sex trafficking in places like Cambodia. This was the case, of course, until her own story of sexual slavery recounted in her autobiography, The Road of Lost Innocence, was shown to be a lie. So as a space of purity, innocence itself appears outside history. And as such, it allows those who work as saviors to ignore the political and historical circumstances that created these victims. <coughs> so white men who save brown women from brown men are allowed to ignore their complicity in creating a category of people who need saving. And they need never ask why these brown women actually want saving, since as innocence, they're understood to lack a desire or agency here. In particular, I'm thinking of Nicholas Kristof trying to rescue um, uh, trafficked women who then, of course, <laughs> left and went back to their, to their work. So this not only allows saviors to feel powerful or knowledgeable, all, but also enables them to simultaneously capture innocence, to purify and absolve themselves. If the people one is saving are understood as innocent outside time and place, and one is intervening only to stop the suffering, how can this not be considered innocent too? In a similar vein, those inspired by humanitarian sentiments may try to bypass politics, claiming to, to act only as witnesses uh, to injustice or in response to the immediacy of suffering. But the political innocence they proclaim ignores the privilege that allows them to act. It's a refusal to acknowledge the structural inequalities that allow some people to be humanitarians, witnesses, or saviors. It also ignores the desire to feel morally upstanding and to absolve oneself of the guilt that accompanies such interventions. Moreover, such moral claims can be pleasurable, as Shireen has shown. Indeed, as Shireen writes in relation to the witnessing of pain, particularly in relation to racialized others, identifying with the suffering of the other can too quickly slip into feeling that one has become that sufferer, both erasing the actual suffering subject and displacing any sense of responsibility toward them. Transnational feminist scholars and anthropologists such as Laila Abuhlugud and Letty Volp have critiqued the yearning for innocence among certain other feminists whose politics are grounded in their desire to save others, such as Muslim women, and to not know about their own complicities in the disenfranch disenfranchisement of those they are saving. Indeed, while the Latin etymology of innocence focuses on harm, so in a sense, not harmful, which is clearly a central, con uh, central feature of the concept, the etymology of innocere, or not to know, is perhaps even more significant. What This is really what interests me here. What does it mean not simply to be empty of knowledge, but to specifically not know? So in the context of US history, James Baldwin understood such explicit not knowing to be a form of racial innocence, meaning that it was based on ignorance. He describes this intolerable, intolerable innocence as Americans' refusal to deal with deeply entrenched forms of racial injustice by holding onto ideologies of equality that undergird the American dream rather than facing the actual historical evidence. Baldwin was describing the way Americans prefer clinging to fantasies suggest that suggest they can move into a race-blind future, that they no longer need to grapple with racial histories, that it does not affect them. Their ignorance allows the posture of innocence. Indeed, racial innocence is a form of deflection, a not knowing or obliviousness that can be politically useful for those in power and that can prompt and justify, f justify further such pursuits of innocence. So today, in this illiberal climate, and here I'm trying to turn to the illiberal version of capturing innocence, we see this racial innocence ever more clearly. We see this not knowing or this ignorance increasingly being deployed and ultimately linked to white supremacy. Charlottesville, of course, is a case in point. What forms of not knowing make it possible for white people to feel that they are the innocent victims, that black folks or Latinos or immigrants are the privileged, the guilty, the undeserving? As Charles Mills suggests, thinking of the erasure of the long history of structural discrimination that has left white people with the differential resources they have today, and I'm quoting, 
If originally whiteness was race, then now it is racelessness and equal status and a common history in which all have shared, with white privilege being conceptually erased. Writing in 2007, Mills quotes Kirk Savage saying that the decision to rehabilitate Robert E. Lee, erasing his status as traitor, signifies a national white reconciliation that required the repudiation of an alternative black memory. Of course, this is what, uh, precisely what enabled and produced Charlottesville. And this same move of erasure, absolution, and purification is apparent in other similar demonstrations around the country. The September in Berkeley, in the face of masses that came together to protest a white supremacist rally, white supremacists portrayed themselves as innocent, simply activating their right to free speech, arguing that they were the ones being bullied. And we see the same type of arguments about innocence offered in relation to charges of gender violence by white men now. Most recently, Roy, Roy Moore, of course, has himself been using the gendered language of witch hunt to describe his victimhood in the face of accusations of sexual assault of young girls. And unsurprisingly, he and his defenders have blamed MSNBC anchor um, Ali Velshi, a Muslim Canadian of Kenyan origin, for this. So this claim, you know, this enables the claim um, that Velshi is the one who is guilty. So I don't mean to say, in, in thinking about this, I don't mean to say that victimhood is the same as innocence, although they are part of the same moral constellation. Indeed, the phrase innocent victim occurs so often that it can be difficult to think of innocent and victim apart. But innocents, of course, need not be victims. Children are one such example. And victims need not be innocent. One can be a victim of crime without being innocent, as we know in the case of women who kill abusers. So I tease this out in the larger project of which this is a part, but I want to say in this illiberal moment, I do think when this kind of victimhood gets evoked and deployed, it depends on an association with innocence, and with blamelessness and purity, lack of agency or desire. Innocence promises a space of purity, which is also its potential. It allows for an engagement with power relations of the dominant order by defining their outer limits. These right-wing movements are drawn to the fact that innocence works to produce the idea of a deserving humanity, one that can escape the compromised and often corrupt nature of political life. White supremacist, white supremacist movements want um, to make claims to uncontaminated spaces, and in this case, of course, it's defined in racial terms. Innocence allows for precisely such a space of purity. That's what it is. Its emptiness allows almost anything to be read into its vacancy, and hence its power. Um, one might say that, they, that these folks are exhibiting a, a nostalgia for a mythical time before responsibility, a time of purity and simplicity, uh, simplicity, even while they use the same set of characteristics to denigrate others as lesser, as outside reason outside humanity. And again, I think this is the power and the appeal of innocence as a way, it's, it's a way to mark boundaries and a way to make human kind. Again, I keep thinking of it not as a, as a thing, but as a method. So I hold on to the fact that even in this illiberal era, um, that much of contemporary politics is driven by this search for innocence, because this figure of the innocent victim is seen as the highest moral good. And in an attempt to steer clear of explicit political solutions and goal, goals, we turn to this to get away from contamination for corruption. But then politics based on innocence requires not only the search for, but also the production of innocent victims, since the pure victim is a placeholder, always just out of reach. The politics of innocence therefore works through a logic of expansion in which new territories of innocence must be constantly discovered and incorporated. This is because the innocent sufferer can never be isolated for long enough to keep it uncorrupted by history or context. In the sense we're constantly displacing politics to the limit of innocence, a border that has to be drawn and redrawn. It's now the turn of white supremacists and of white patriarchy more broadly to claim innocence explicitly, not simply to rely on it implicitly, which of course has always been the case, what the Colonial Settler Project was about. In a letter to my nephew, Baldwin writes, I know what the world has done to my brother and how narrowly he has survived it, and I know, which is much worse, and this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen and for which I, I nor time nor history will ever forgive them, that they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and do not know it and do not want to know it. It is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. 
So if we turn at last to kind of my opening question or provocation, would getting rid of the concept of innocence enable us to better address gendered and racist violence? My answer would be yes. There's no innocent standpoint, no place of moral transcendence. The opposite of innocence in the sense I've been de developing here is not guilt, but impurity. It seems that a better way to address racist and gendered violence is to embrace our contaminated reality and let b that be the site of new political emergence. Thank you. So I don't want to take time with this. I mean, we've had some very powerful talks, all of which you know, intersect in interesting ways, but also open up different territories. So I think if you just want to address your questions to everyone or to particular people, uh, please go ahead. And, uh, Hi. Can you stand up? Yeah, so that people can hear. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Anwar. My name is Anwar Mahajni, and I said that because I'm um, Palestinian Israeli as well. My question is for Nadira. So I, I'm interested, so we're, we're talking about state violence, but what I'm interested more in is how people or individuals respond to state violence. Struck me with what you said is that the girls, even though despite all, all the harassment and the restrictions that they were facing, they kept going to school and they're still going to school. And also, even though their father saw what's happening to the girls, he still allowed them to go to school despite of all of that. So I was wondering, do you think there is now a politicization of education in a sense of it as a form of resistance to the Israeli state? Thank you. Thank you, Anwar. Nadira. Nadira. <laughs> so, yes, I, I think that your point is extremely important because with all the hardships and violence, you see girls walking to school every day, you see their support to each other, and because of, because of the kind of work I do, they also today, they write letters, they inform me of what is going on. And part of me realizing what goes on with the rifles was their way of expressing it, so they can identify criminality, they can identify violence, they know what violence is, what crime is. But I think that we never, we, we always, they never see their power. So I think that yes, I do want to thank you for the question and point to their power to resist by walking the walk to every day. But we need to also take into consideration the amount of violence says against them that is really affecting their daily life. Do the microphone, it's easier for everybody to hear. It's just this is wonderful, wonderful presentations, so evocative, and I'm sorry I can't participate in a bigger discussion of all of this. Lila said these intersections were amazing. So I wanted to just ask one question that relates to everybody's, but really Nara and Shireen, it on the other side of terror, state terrorism, is this, what I perceive, is this need, this masculine need to uh, self-affirm, that the sexualization and the use of rifles is a way of saying, yes, I exist, I am powerful. It's so incredible why sexuality and the focus on young girls, your question at the beginning, Nadra, why? Why these young girls, what does that do? And I just want to throw in one other thing that's not related to that at all. But I went to Winslow, Arizona one time. Winslow, Arizona is an example of the reoccupation of space that like, this is goes to actually to, to Miriam's point about the conversion into innocence. Winslow, Arizona was made into a popular song you know that song, Winslow, Arizona, you guys? I can't remember. Who was this thing? Okay. And it's also converted into a reenactment of the frontier town. It's so romantic. It's so beautified. And it's also, you know, a space of colonial racial violence against the indigenous people who are nearby. So... Uh, 
question there. But if it is well, I just make a, a quick comment about I'm always of two minds what, what, what word to use to describe the instability of the colonial subject. I don't want to call that subject a fragile subject, but I'm, I'm very mindful of, I, I like Fanon's uh, <laughs> stuff about colonialism as a psychosis and, and this being a psychotic subject and this, uh, the settler city is a psychotic city, which, which I think Achille Mbembe invoked because there's so much about it that is frenzied and, and hysterical and, and you know the encounters are like that in the everyday and that's why the everyday is the key to all of this. Uh, what is what is you know uh, Shipley going around with extra extra handguns in his cop car? Uh, what is that about uh, in terms of the policing? And and there's so many things you can point to that that is like that, a kind of like living permanently on edge, uh, and it's the settlers that are on edge, <laughs> which is the you know the important thing. Um, the, the the colonized are living uh, in a, a, a state of fear and, and tension, um, and so you can see those things. But it's 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 rather surprising to think of the settler as not at all complacent, expecting any minute threat. Uh, you know, psychoanalytically, I, I love the work of Klaus Theberleit about German fascists before the, the you know the Second World War. I mean, that's work that to me really captures this kind of living, constantly feeling that you're about to be overwhelmed by the flood. Yeah, um, I, would, I would say one thing, you know, just looking at the past couple of months, the invasions of schools, the violation of the school, uh, the walk to school, the fact that it's, it became something that everybody is seeing, but nobody is seeing. And everybody is, is, you know, the media and the coverage is right away a coverage of a terrorist or a young girl. Nobody looks at Fatmi and Nuf as little girls. Nobody looks at those rifles standing in Babel Amud, in Babel Khalil, in our every single step where we go as as e extension of that power. And yes, that's exactly why it is, um, it's telling a lot. Number one, it's telling us that the settlers are afraid and they're afraid because they're criminals, because they know that the land is stolen and because they know that dispossession is hard at work. And number two, it's really telling us that it's changing the internal dynamics because of this transgressional violence because the girls are changing their paths and parents, teachers, and schools are unable to control what goes on. If you can't control the mere path to school to girls, if you can't safeguard home, because home is invadable, and space is invadable, and the body is invaded day and night, every walk, that is very telling. That is very telling number that, that the settler colonialism is still hard at work. But this penetratable power, the power to penetrate, to rape, even a dead body with Nuf, Nuf was still alive, Nakoshi was still struggling. And if I showed you the, the, the video, the way they were talking to her, the settlers, while holding the, the, the rifles, even while she's almost dead, it's there to tell a real story, the story of state terror, and it should be called state terror rather be framed as girls' terrorism or Palestinian girls stabbed. And we don't have, you know, one thing that is very, very important to say that we can't even, as Palestinians, we can't prove otherwise. The cameras are under their control, the police are under their control, the proofs are under their control, and even if their interrogations are by force and by torture, they're still admissible in court in that justice system that has no justice to the other that is considered out of, of humanity. And I think bringing the, the path and the route and the experience of schoolgirls to, to the table today is, is really to ask you to, and to invite you to look at that side in a different way. Thank you for these really powerful and 
devastating uh, presentations. Uh, there's one image that stood out for me um, so much in, in Shireen's presentation, which is the bottle of pills that was left on the ground and then the talk about the illness and early childhood diabetes and the, the effects on the victims of these systems of state terror, really, and I'm very convinced by, by your point. And um, some of my students in my class are here, and we're taught, we're, we have a class on called Narrating Rape, and it, it's about um, narratives of, of gender violence. And we always talk about who tells the story, who frames the photograph, and how can we um, refocalize and actually try to figure out what the one who's not telling the story may be feeling. And another as talk, you have these wonderful interviews and letters uh, emails, I presume, from the girls. But in your story, Shireen, we really don't know um, how these, w you, you said you, you want to know how the policeman is feeling, but how are these women feeling? And how can we fill in some of these absent voices and uh, really feelings? And um, I don't know how you, you pose that, that question. I'll just, I'll just quickly say that um, my attempt to do that is to kind of reconstruct the everyday that Nadra talked about, like what happens at 7 a.m., what happened at the school. And, and there is in the file quite a lengthy story of L'Oreal Singanese uh, connection to policing, a lot. And it tells the story of what her daily life was like. And you can certainly use that to, to, to tell the story. The part about the mental illness, recently I, you know, Melanie Yazzi, who's also working on this, uh, um, we talked about the fact that, you know, I was trying to persuade her um, to, to never take the conversation in the direction of those pills, because those pills are the heart of the police story at the moment. I mean, that's the police's story, is that they're dealing with somebody unstable. Um, and even in the police record, although Shipley said he had never met her before and didn't know her, there are police documents that he was the arresting officer in, in two incidents where he entered into the file that she was mentally unstable. Uh, and so they're going to use that narrative and run with it. Uh, not that they have to run with anything because they did get away with it completely without much, much talk. But we have, to, we have to worry about that angle. In, in many ways, and I, I particularly want to worry about that when I try to reconstruct the everyday terror, because the mental illness part is a part of the everyday terror, <laughs> the, the access to it. But I'm very worried about going there. If, if I may say one, one other thing, and sometimes you can find that bottle of, of, of medicine, but some in other context, like I, when I look at what goes on in, in, in East Jerusalem, for example, the fact that the police would know the names of the girls because they call each other. So Abir would call uh, Salwa. And the second day when they pass, they will start calling Abir, Abir. Now, those things, sometimes you can't find it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. But it means so much in that context because when they're walking in the street and the shop owners realize that the soldiers and the police are calling their names, it raises a million questions. It causes um, another disorder to con ta kind of control what goes on. And those aspects that we put together, you know, whether in the bottle of medicine or in things that are not seen, they're heard, they're, they're not visible, but they're so strong. And they change the entire way of us analyzing that state terror that is not a bleeding body, but is there, that works, you know, on the everydayness at 7.15 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah, I can't see. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> thank you um, to all of you. Really, thank you very much. And it is a sort of a hard uh, set of talks to follow up with questions. Um, I have uh, one question, actually, that um, would be I would be interested in hearing in, in terms of how, if you thought of, if you could think now about how the three, t or how this concept of innocence that uh, Yam brought up could actually uh, work in relation to the other talks. Obviously, there is another, uh, the, you know, the idea that the innocence is stolen, forbidden. Uh, but I, I mean, I have 
some thoughts, but I would like to hear your thoughts in terms of, uh, because uh, let me say maybe why I'm asking, because I, at the moment I kind of feel like we're left with um, the idea that colonial violence is there, we know it's state violence is there, it's very not innocent, it's the opposite of innocence, and then we have innocence as what we're invested in uh, somehow. So I interested in that. Thank you. Let me think. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I mean, I, yeah, you could read it in multiple ways, as you just said. I mean, to me, they're, both talks were very much about the ways innocence plays or doesn't play and the reason that Palestinian girls are not able to, are able to be violated in all those ways is precisely because they're not allowed to be innocent. The colonial regime refuses that, right? Um, and then in, in Shireen, similarly, I think, um, as she said herself at the end, that, uh, that what we have to look at is the ways in which the Canadian or any settler colonial state um, renders itself innocent, the, its actions innocent. This is in the name of somebody who's disturbed and mentally ill, and, and it's not doing anything wrong. So I think innocence plays in all those kinds of ways. I think what I, I didn't talk about, I think what you're saying is the ways in which innocence actually becomes compelling to us all, right? Um, and the ways in which it plays. And I, uh, that's part of, I think, um, uh, work that I've done on humanitarianism, for instance, where um, the most compelling subject is an innocent subject, right? Is somebody who elicits our compassion and our pity, somebody who didn't deserve what happened to them in these particular ways, which is, of course, a racialized and gendered subject, right? Um, and I think we're all part of, we all get moved by that in different ways, right? I mean, I didn't show the, fict uh, the picture of Ilan Kurdi because it upsets people. Um, n n I mean, not that it, it's not, it is upsetting, but it, uh, it evokes a whole, like, th think about the frames that it enters into and the things that it evokes. Um, so I feel like, um, to me, I, I'm constantly trying to move beyond I don't think innocence helps anyone. It just ends up penalizing the majority of people and criminalizing and rendering guilty. Um, uh, I gave this talk, our kind of a very early version of it once when I was um, at a, a kind of a, it was a philosophy, political theory uh, talk. And many of the men got really upset with me and said, what do you mean? We've just gotten the concepts of vulnerability and, and innocence and so on. And these are very powerful terms, and why should we get rid of them? And I just thought, well, you know, who have they ever helped? You know, who have they really? And of course, they do help some people. People know how to mobilize them. Um, and they can give rights, and they can give recognition, and they can but I think at the expense of, of much greater forms of violence and greater forms of inequality. So I don't know if that, that uh, speaks to you. I, I just want to add one quick thing to that. I think uh, I could get accused of really uh, narrow thinking here, but I think innocence is always secured through appeal to the racial, mm -hmm. uh, always. Uh, and in, Sh in Shipley's case, it's very obvious. He's, he, his innocence uh, is believed in by everybody, not just the legal forum, uh, because L'Oreal is able to be represented as threat. Um, and so there's like no situation where uh, an innocent subject is made that the, you don't see sort of hovering in the background a racially superior one. And in Miriam's work, you see that subject as, as the savior who is always racial, uh, is always white. Um, so, you know, if you follow the race line, that's, that's where you see innocence doing its work. Mm -hmm. Well, somehow when you asked the question, I thought about God and innocence. Because, you know, since I talk about um, Palestine and since, uh, you know, God was turned into a real estate agent and uh, taking land from one side and giving <coughs> to the other, so I was thinking about those innocent that came to live in, in that uh, land. And this is what came, you know, it's a political economy of innocence where I really, you know, I found myself when you were talking, Miriam, that, you know, it is criminal, it's, but it's even beyond. It's so necropolitical mm. because it allows some to live and mm. it, it steals life from others. And therefore, you know, it's very important to, to take it to, to your analysis. Mm. One last. I did not know 
I did not know about the things going on in Canada. Yeah. So, not anything. This I case is Arizona, right? That I talked uh, about. Yeah, no, <laughs> but I mean, I, you know, I appreciate yeah. having heard it. I didn't ever concentrate about, you know, about that. I certainly have known for decades, since I was a little girl, about how awful things were in Palestine, Israel. Lots of people know this. What in the world can we do? You know, somebody said something about BDS and it's treated like, oh my God, what a horrible thing you're doing. What can we do to really get serious about this stuff? I don't, I don't know. You're all up there. Come up with some genius. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think we'll leave that for everyone to uh, come up with solutions on their own uh, for the impossible questions. But, but you're right. I mean, the, you listen to this, you see this, you get the analysis, and then say, what do we do about this? Mm. And it just, you know. I would say to keep on doing because we, we really don't have this luxury of being depressed and where what can we do. We cannot raise our hands and say nothing. We need to keep on talking and trying because it's not a local game it's really a global politics yeah. and without a global movement there's nothing can, n n things are not moving so the entire support to Israel blindly in so many ways is a, is helping the you know it's not silenced we're speaking we're talking we're writing we're we're trying and we should keep on trying we can't raise our hands and say for no for Fatmi because Fatmi was was one of the best students in math. She was planning to go to Malaysia to be one of those that would win the math test. She had all sorts of dreams, and she ended up sh shot in, an, in, in Bab al Amud. And I think that just for those, that for those voices that spoke and that did not speak, we should keep on walking the walk. But we're also renaming things, and I think that's a very powerful action. Right? We're naming things differently. So we're eliminating the mitigating narrative that mm. enabled some of these crimes. Mm. I, I just want to share something someone said to me when I got asked this question. <laughs> someone said, the question is not what will we do, but what are you doing now? Mm. <laughs> That's, That's yeah. sustaining it. <laughs> Should we leave it at that? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs>